up, HC? All right, so I know some of us are still, still settling back down to our seats, but I'm going to need a little more energy than that at a chapel on a Tuesday morning in the fall at Highlands College in the great state of Alabama. Come on, what's up, HC? Anybody excited to be here today? Okay, I, I kind of believe it. I'm going to give you one more chance. Anybody grateful to be in this room right now? That's it. That's it. That's it. It's awesome, awesome to be with you guys. I mean, I love you guys so much. I love the HC family. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, HC family. And so, um, and honestly, I'm, I'm having a moment. I haven't been in this room the last couple of weeks. And so just being back in, in chapel for me is really powerful today. Just sensing God's presence. Never want to take for granted that God shows up, that when we worship. I know it's, it's routine because it's Tuesday and Thursday now. You're kind of getting to the flow of the semester. But God's presence is here today. And I just love, love, love uh, watching you guys lean in. And honestly, before we go any further today, I wasn't even planning on this. But this just is a moment I want to edify you guys. That has been the recurring message I have heard from the entire faculty and team at HC. Um, of course, they love you guys. They're obviously going to brag on you. But I've heard it from every church staff member. I've heard it from people who are, are a part of our church family who are just experiencing coming across paths with you guys, maybe on the Dream Team or serving at a campus. And everyone is saying the same thing, is that HC is different this fall. And so I just want to honor you. Come on, HC team, can we honor the student body? I just want to honor you guys for leaning in. And so... It's one thing to be here. It's like, it's a big deal, actually, that you're here. It's another thing. It's Delaney. By the way, Delaney just crushed that. My goodness. Crushed that. I mean, she's already got the title president. Just take my job, girl. What are you trying to do? And so, um, honestly, she said it best. Like, it's, it's another thing. Just it's, it's one thing to have that trust, but then to really, to really lean into God and to trust Him is what you're doing. So I want to, can I just edify you? all receive that today. You're doing a great job. I just want to fan that into flame today. You're doing a really great job. And as we get into the middle of the semester, it's super important because uh, the, the enemy can step into familiarity. Now we're familiar, and you can kind of get past that initial moment. And so let's make this the September surge. Come on, somebody. Like, we're just, we're, woo, we're just pushing in to all that God has. And so, and hey, it's going to be fall so soon. Like the fall weather so soon. It's the perfect time uh, to be here at HC. And so, and in fact, we need some, I mean, in this perfect time for coffee, where are the pumpkin spice? That's not me, but why don't we even do this? How about this? And we'll just make sure that somebody pays for this. Tomorrow, everybody gets a free cup of coffee at the Bistro in HC. Because September surge. Y'all okay with that? I might be blushing. I might be blushing. I don't know how we're going to pay for that. Michael, you got it. Put it on Michael's credit card. No, I'm very serious. I'm September surge. We need a little caffeine. We had a lot of Holy Spirit and some caffeine. Tomorrow, if you go to the bistro, tell them I'm here for September surge. You get a free whatever you want. Y'all receive that? All right. Fan that in the flame. And, and faculty and team too. Let's just do it. We're Santa Claus right now. It's faculty and team too. All right. So, but hey, it's, it's, it's a, um, somebody will pay for that. It'll be great. Michael's got it, but. But I do, I do, I actually, I want to bless you guys and just to, to edify you today. And so today we're stepping into our, to our kind of the message portion of chapel. You're already leaning in. I want you guys to keep leaning in. Uh, before we get into that part of the, of the service, so I want to honor a few people that we have in the room. Uh, it's always amazing that people take time out of their schedule, their busy life, uh, to come be in the room as so we have different groups. We have some impact donors that are here today sitting over in this section. Can you guys honor those who are investing into the college? Amazing. Stay on your feet. We also have some guests of our speaker today, Glenn Siddle, who you'll introduce, I'll introduce in a moment. But we have some of his guests who are here today on the second row. Y'all honor them. And then one last group as well. We actually have a church from Tennessee, Long Hollow Church, who's here studying HCLI. Can y'all honor them? I'm not sure where they are. Honor them as well. Awesome. Awesome. Y'all can have a seat. And so... Um, just always amazed that people, um, not, not actually not amazed because God's in it, but just it's always such, a, such an encouragement when people hear the vision of Highlands College and get as excited as we are about it because we, we know it just is another, just another moment, another sign that God is in this entire thing. And so honor all those guests who are here today. Excited that we are in the middle of this Remain series. And so last week, y'all, my favorite preacher, Jill was here on Tuesday last week. She's in the room today, my favorite preacher. And then I think it was Pastor Wynn and Brad on Thursday who preached. That South African accent just makes everything more spiritual. 
And so for part three today, I'm actually going to be here but along with someone else. We're actually going to have a conversation, so a little different style today. And so Glenn Siddle, I've already mentioned his name. Glenn Siddle is a very important person in my life and a very important person to Highlands College. And so I met Glenn and his amazing wife, Lucy, I don't even know how many years ago uh, when, the, when their girls, we'll tell more of the story, but when their girls were here at Highlands in student ministry when I was a youth pastor. And Glenn and Lucy are really, to me, everything that, that I would look to. They're, they're not old, but they're further on in their journey with God than Jill and I. And so immediately their, their marriage, uh, for me, the way Glenn loves Jesus, the way he leads his business, he's the president of a construction company called Newcastle, founder and president, the way he leads his business. And so this is just like a side lesson today. When you guys, when God brings someone like that across your path, it's, it's for a reason, or at least you need to step into it and see what God has for you. And so I did that. I just stepped into that relationship and asked him to be a mentor in my life, which he graciously has done now for, for well over a decade, speaking into every area of my life, from our Jill and I's relationship to our, how we, we manage our, our finances to our home, all those areas. There's nothing off limits um, because I just respect him so much. And so he's a mentor in my life. And then when the Highlands College vision started to come together, he heard Pastor Chris just share the vision of HC. And again, we'll tell more of this story in a moment. And immediately responded to that, which I cannot tell you guys how much that means to me. When early on in a vision, when someone comes around that, I'm grateful for everyone else who will always come around. It's so grateful. But in those early days, when it is just a dream, and God sends someone who sees what you see, even though there's nothing to see yet in the natural, that's a really big deal. And Glenn and Lucy saw Highlands College before there was a Highlands College. And they begin to invest their time, their energy, their resources into HC. And he sits on our board of directors, so he is in authority over me, even structurally here in the college, and is a huge part of that, of that team. But they have invested, literally, they are at the top of our donors in the entire history of Highlands College. This couple has invested so much into this college, and all of us are beneficiaries of that. Can you guys welcome to the stage Glenn Siddle as he comes to share with me today? on here we go so y'all um um yeah y'all can have a seat so i'm excited for us to be here today honestly dream come true to have you back at chapel you've been here it's been a, a few years back um but i have you back at chapel and uh just would love you to take a few moments we're going to go through some questions I actually have some questions even from students but would love first just for you to kind of share who you are a little more than even i did and even especially your testimony because i want these students to hear the power of what god has done in your life well, i gotta say a couple things first uh it's very humbling to be up here with pastor mark and then i see pastor wren pastor lane sneak in here uh these three guys were i have twin daughters who are 29 they were uh my daughter's pastors for eight years and when they find out that i'm just dad to them and when they find out i was up on this stage and these two guys were sitting over here there i can hear it right now they're gonna say wait what why were you up there <laughs> i mean so anyway, I'm honored to be up here, but another thing I wanted to share real quick is um, this morning I was reading in John 4, you all know the story about Jesus, at, at the lady at the well, where he said to go tell your husband, she said, I don't have a husband, he said, yeah, you have five, and she's like, oh, sir, I perceive you're a prophet, and then she said something, and, and he said this, this is important for you guys to catch, he said, you people of Samaritans, you worship a God you do not know, we worship a God we do know. Isn't that kind of like the, 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 the first step of Church of the Highlands? No God. But then he said this. He said, the day will come when people will worship God in spirit and in truth. And when I look at it, you guys, today with your hands up, when I got saved 40 years ago, you didn't do this. My wife and I got saved in a church that raised our hands, and we were called heretics. Because at the church I grew up in, you had an organ and a choir. And if you raise your hand, something was wrong. I'm just telling you. God is, the Bible says that this is what God seeks, is what you're doing right here. So as a father, I just want to honor you, what Mark just said a minute ago. I want to honor you as you're pleasing your heavenly father when you do what you just did. So that's, that's anyway. inc It's incredible. And I honestly, can you just build off there? Because I love y'all's testimony and just the story of what God did in, in both yours and Lucy's, Lucy's life. And I'd love you just to maybe, I think it would be so encouraging for them. A couple of reasons. One, it's a powerful story. Uh, secondly, is in ministry, these students are going to have the opportunity to lead others in those same years, year, those college age years uh, to Jesus. And the power of that years later, getting to see the compounding effect of that is amazing. So would you share some? Well, I'm going to keep this G-rated because I'm up here. But, um, you know, when, when, I, when I got saved, that was a mess. I was 22 years old. I got kicked out of college at Auburn. I've been there for four years. I was barely a junior. Um, I was partying every night. And it, it was just, it was a bad deal. I deserved to be kicked out of school. I was making bad grades. 
I came home to Birmingham and I was um, climbing telephone poles. I was making good money. Had two brothers and we were going out every night partying. And there are a couple of events that happened during those six months I was home that, that almost got me in a lot of trouble. And, and it just, I started just realizing that there had to be something else to this life. And I just think there was a guy in, at Auburn that I met my very first week there that had witnessed to me for four years. There's people in this room that you're, you're loving on somebody and you've been doing it and you wonder if God's ever going to answer. This guy shared with me, come to my apartment and, and you could walk in my apartment and you could tell I was not a Christian. He never told me I was going to go to hell. He just loved me. And, and when I went back to school, I knew that if I did, they told me I had to make a B average, which I had never done. I know that's embarrassing when you're talking to college and you tell them that. I do have to pause and say, you got kicked, you got kicked out of Auburn. That's, 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 yeah. that's, they, they take anybody down there, right? Well, right. Back then they took me. They did take me. But what happened is I go back to school and I knew that if I didn't change, it was going to be bad. And, and I made a radical decision. When I say radical, I just walked away from everything. And, uh, and I, I mean my two brothers who were my best friends. I just had to walk away from them too. And honestly, if you guys would have seen me at 20 or 21 years old and look at me now, in my high school, I would have picked the most likely to die early or end up in prison. And the only reunion I ever went to was my 20-year reunion. They voted me the most changed person. And I went there because I wanted them to see that, that God can change a life. But uh, this is for some of you guys out there because I was such an average student. I was average in every way, below average in most ways. But God just looks for somebody whose heart is his. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Because some of you guys need to hear. Some of you, like me, you weren't born in the right family. You didn't have all the accolades. You weren't the most athletic or the best looking or whatever. It doesn't matter. God doesn't look at that. He looks at one thing, your heart. He's looking for a man whose heart is his, what the Bible says, man or woman. So can you share, um, first of all, you're already preaching. That is so powerful. And you're living it, which is the, is the most powerful part. Can you share a little bit about your story even with Lucy and how, how you guys... Uh, ended up getting married. Well, and I'm going to talk about, um, you know, hearing from God. So I, I walked away from church when I was probably 15. My parents didn't make me go anymore. I just kind of hated it because it was the church that they went to is about rules. It wasn't about a relationship with God. It's rule. Do this, do this. You know, I just felt it was in the Bible. If you smoke cigarettes and, and don't cut your hair, you're going to go to hell. And, and that's how I, it's like rules. That's what, that's what Christianity was to me. So I quit going. Uh, when I got radically saved, um, I had never heard that you can hear from God. And this is something I want to share with you guys um, that we're going to get into about hearing from God because my, my pastor, so the night I got saved, I just walked away from a lot of stuff. And it was hard for me. It was one of the, it's the only time I can remember as a young man that I cried because I was, just, it was it's like I knew I was going to have to sever my relationship with my two brothers. And that was hard for me because we, we looked like we were having a lot of fun, but it was going, both of my brothers died in their 40s. And, and I was going that same direction. But I went to my pastor the first week I was saved, and I, I went, went to him, and I said, ma'am, his name was Mark. And I said, Mark, you know, it, it was funny because he, 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 he knew my past, a little bit of it, and he was worried I wasn't going to make it, so he spent time with me. But I told him, I said, Mark, you know, I've given up everything, but there's one challenge in my life, and, and that is there was a girl I was in a relationship with for two years, and she was wanting to get saved and, and just keep on going. And in the natural... It looked like the thing to do. It just, in my natural mind, it looked like, but I told my pastor, I said, I, I don't know what to do here. And this is for some of you, because you got a big decision to make about something. And, and here's how I learned how to hear from God. I'm sitting across the desk from him, and he said this. He said, Glenn, let's not, just clear your mind for a minute. Don't think about what you want or what she wants or what your friends or your parents or her parents want. What do you think in your heart God wants? Nobody had ever talked to me like that. But you know, God puts his spirit inside of us to know right from wrong. And I just said, without even thinking, without using my mind, I said, I think God wants me to break up with her. And my pastor said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your pastor. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, first verses I've ever, ever memorized. I went home and broke up with that girl. And so... Three weeks after getting saved, I'm sitting there mentally, and my mind was, I still had thoughts that weren't pure, and I was struggling with it, but God was looking at my heart, and I was just crying out. I was like, God, please, I just, I have broken this off. I've broken off my relationship with my brothers, but I need help with this, and listen to this. On October 29, 1983, I was outside church with about 20 kids, three weeks after becoming a Christian, 
And I heard a little voice behind me, a young lady, and I heard inside of me say, that's going to be your wife. And I turned around, and there's this angel who was up in the worship team. I didn't know her name. I knew nothing about her. I just knew she was on a worship team in a church. I had never been in a church like this. But it, what God was showing me is that, Glenn, I've seen your heart, and I've got something so much better for you than what you thought you could. And, and honestly, I never thought about that girl again. And, it, you know, and I, I just thought, I've got to really purify my life to deserve something like that. And next year, we've been married 40 years, so it obviously works. So. <laughs> So I want to come back to hearing from God because there's a lot there. We'll, we'll get, I want to get into it because I know that's one of the main questions we always hear from Highlands College students and college-age students in general is just how to, how to really hear the voice of God and discern the will of God. So I want to come back to that. Uh, let's, let's get forward a little bit, and, and you can share any of the story of Newcastle or, or kids, any part of that, that journey because there's a lot there. But you guys end up at Highlands at some point, and I, I think it's always fun just to hear people's Highlands story. So how did you guys end up uh, yeah, at, at Church of the Highlands way back in the day? Well, and this, this was probably, I think, about 15 years ago. So we weren't the early birds that, that got here first. But, but our girls, we've always kind of been very involved with them, whether they were in elementary school or middle school or whatever. And uh, they, they went to a private Christian school here. I won't name the name. But uh, it was a good school in a lot of ways academically. But they weren't really hearing about have, how to have a relationship with God. And when they were probably about 14, they visited here. And I think at first, Pastor Lane was their pastor. Then Mark was their, their youth pastor. But, and, and I asked the girls the other day, they're in different states now, and I asked them, what was it in your mind that really made you want to come to Highlands? And, and they both answered, but they said, you know, at Highlands, it was more about a relationship with God. And, and one of them said, I have pages and pages of notes of Pastor Mark talking, and we never had that at our last church. We didn't sit and take notes. But they said, we saw people just like you that were pursuing God with all their heart. And we wanted to be a part of that. And so my wife and I, I remember the first time we came to church in, 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 at Highlands at the main campus with our girls. They're like 14 years old. And the very first time we came in there with them, they raised their hands in worship. And Lucy and I just looked at each other because the church we were going to didn't do that. And we just winked. It's like this is where we're supposed to be. Because it's, just, it's such a purity that, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, it's going all over the world right now. The churches that are growing are similar to what we're doing here which is exciting. That's really, really cool. Where, where are the uh, student ministry or kids major students? Raise your hands. Come on. And I just, I just take that moment to edify you guys. Like a family was reached through the student ministry, through Amen. the kids ministry. Amen. And there's so many stories. I hear so many stories just like that. And why are you at Highlands or why are you connected? Why are you even saved? It's because God did something in my student's life or my, my, my son or daughter's life. And so I, I love that story. So I want to just lean into some content here because um, there's so much wisdom you have. We could do a whole series, honestly, on on um, just all the, all the wisdom that you have. And I love that you've collected it, different formats. I've, I have the, I'm the beneficiary of some of your study material mm -hmm. that you have, but I also love that you've written a book on some of the habits that have led you to where you are today. And so I'd love us to spend a few minutes on that. Um, in that book on healthy habits, there's a lot of different habits. We're going to come back to hearing from God maybe towards the end, but maybe even before that, what are some of the other primary habits that at a college age, even in ministry school age, are the most important habits that these students can take yeah. put into their life that can lead them to significance. Amen. And I'll tell you this, guys. Uh, to, to, to be truly effective with your life, you have to form habits. I, I'm just, I've, been, I've been around a little while, and I've seen people that have um, been short-term successful and lost it. But when somebody sustains su success, and success to me is just you take whatever talent you have. I don't have a lot of talent, but I, I know the ones that I do have and when you multiply those talents, God gives you more and he's happy, okay? There's a lot of people that squander their talents, but the way you multiply your talents and be effective is you form daily habits. Because one thing, it doesn't matter, and this will set some of you free. It doesn't matter what side of the track you're from or what color your skin is. My parents were from Scotland. We have very little money. We, we didn't have all the pedigree, but when I got saved, I just learned to form good habits. I got around people and uh, where this came from, I was, I was spending a lot of time with college students when my girls were at Auburn, and they, they, these kids would come up to our lake house, and there were several guys that would come up there, and I, God didn't give me physical sons. I grew up with two brothers, and my wife grew up with four brothers, and we just knew we were going to have boys, and then God gave us these sweet little girls, and neither one of us knew what to do with them, you know, but, but when we got these guys in college, it just, I just saw them, I was like a father to them, 
And they wanted to, it was like I was mentoring a lot of them. And my wife likes to tell the story. One time at Father's Day, we were down there, and there were eight of these guys at the lake house. And on the way home, she was saying, you know, none of them went home to be with their father. They were with you. And it was just something I was very passionate with. And these guys, I, I, I did a, when I, they all graduated, I had them all come to Birmingham and, and uh, just poured into their life for a weekend. With, with pa Pastor Mark came, I had pastors and business guys. And I invited 21 guys to come, and 20 of them showed up. One of them asked me, he said, when you speak, will you speak to us about the habits that you've been telling us at the lake house for the last four years. And, and I ended up writing a book on it, but there's five habits. And the first one, obviously, reading, reading the word. I think it's the most, if I could tell you one thing, if I tell you one thing to do, it's to get in the word every day, but you gotta know why. You're gonna read the word because you wanna know God. You know, there's two places in the Bible where Jesus said, depart from me, I never knew you. And one of those places in Matthew, he's talking to religious people. Because they say, did we not do this, cast out demons and heal? Did we not do this in your name? I can see people saying, did I not go to church every Sunday? And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. So it's important that we know God. So knowing why we, we read the Bible. But here's something for college students I think you, you guys need, because I needed it. I needed this. My, I, I believe our mind is like a computer. The, the garbage in, garbage out. But when I got saved, over 90% of the stuff in my mind was negative. And because your mind is like a computer, you don't just lose it. It's still there. But what I learned to do is, is dilute it with so much positive. I believe now my mind is probably 98% positive. I diluted it by having good habits and getting in the Word and doing things. But when I was first saved at 22, I had to break some really bad thought processes. And here's two things that I have learned that became habits for me, and they're still habits 40 years later. Number one, Jesus said in Matthew 6, in the, in the um, Sermon on the Mount, he told his disciples and all the people out there, when you fast, do it like this. And he said, don't do it like the hypocrites where they do it to be seen by man. Go in private and your father who sees you in secret will repay you. I read that when you fast. I never knew what that was. I was 22 years old and did not know what that meant. What do you mean when you fast? My parents didn't fast. Church I grew up in didn't fast. They didn't talk about fasting. So what I did, and this is funny, Mark, back then... You did, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have cell phone. We didn't even have computers yet. I went and bought a, a concordance. I don't know if you guys have ever seen one. They're big. So I, I read the New American Standard. It, you can look every word that's in the New American Standard. It will show you every verse it's in. Right now you just do it on your phone. But I looked up fasting, every verse, and I read it and studied it. Fast, fasting, fasted. There's a bunch of scripture on it, but it led me to Isaiah 58. In Isaiah 58, Isaiah, God is speaking through Isaiah, and he said, here is the fast that I choose. Now, that got my attention, because Jesus already said we're supposed to fast. Here is the fast that I choose. I want to break bondage in your life and undo the yoke. And I'm reading that, and I'm thinking, man, there is bondage in my mind. And I just started fasting as a college. I didn't tell anybody. Nobody knew this. I, if I'd have told my parents, they would have, have pulled me home from college. They're like, you know, Glenn. I mean, they, they basically, it's like, we want you to get saved, but not that saved. It was radical. And they were, they were like, Glenn, we just we thought maybe you could put a foot in and just see, you know, go to church and be a nice guy. And, and I just started fasting one day a week. And God just broke the bondage off of my life. And when I saw that happen, I started fasting for my little brother. He was my best friend. And when he was 12 or 13 years old, I got him on drugs. And when I got saved, all I wanted was for him to get off drugs. And see the freedom that I had. And so I started fasting. And, and you know the Bible never says how often to fast. or how, It doesn't say it. But it does say to fast. And so I would just challenge you guys. Those of you who are. You know some of y'all are still. You've had a past of pornography. And the problem with that is. You don't lose those pictures. They're in your mind. That's the problem with it. You need to break that. And the way to break it. I think fasting can break that over your life. I still do it today 40 years later. And then the second thing, real quick, is, is learn to confess. The Bible says in James that, that your tongue is like a rudder on a ship. Small, small part of the ship, it will guide the ship all the way across the ocean. So in the same way, your tongue will guide your entire life. In Genesis, God said he created the earth with what? Spoken word. Then he created us in his image. We're, we have the ability to speak things. Faith is speaking something into existence at, Something that is not as though it were. And here, here's the thing. When Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, 
The devil tempted him three times. And what did Jesus do each time? It is written. It is written. He quoted Deuteronomy three times. And I read that. I just, I just have simple. I'm a simple person. And I just thought, well, if Jesus did that, I should do that. And I started confessing scriptures. I started writing them down. And here, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, most quoted scripture for me as a young man. No temptation shall overtake you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. With the temptation will provide the way of escape that you'll be able to endure it. When the enemy is coming against your mind and tempting you and you say that verse out loud, I don't think he hangs out in your room any longer. And I'm just, I'm just telling you guys, it's wor- it works for me. I still, this morning, was confessing scriptures out loud. Just stuff I want right now in my life. Because I just hold my Bible up and say, God, you said this in your word. And it says you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. I just believe it's still true. First of all, that's, 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 that's so powerful. It's the, the power. You know, I think about, as, even as I read your book years ago and was coming back to it, it's so powerful because these are commonly known in church life, some of these words like fasting or confessing the word. But it's the, ha- the power is in the habit of it. And I love the testimony of how you live that out. I wanna, before we get into the, the, the really hearing from God's word and hearing from God, I would love to dig into those two thoughts a little more. So just thinking about fasting, if a student wants to begin the lifestyle of fasting, preparing for that, you know, how did you settle on one day a week? I'm not saying there's a formula for all that, but even going through a process of that, and then how have you approached that and kept it life-giving and not legalistic? And, and that's a really good point, because you don't want to be legalistic about anything. And, and honestly, until I got married, nobody knew I was doing this. I didn't do it to, to get a little check mark, you know, or write down a, a goal that I had or something like that. I did it because I believed the Bible and I wanted to have bondage broken in my life. And, and so I just started fasting from Sunday night to Tuesday morning. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but here's the thing. Pray. The devil's not going to tell you to fast. Uh, he might tell you to fast 80 days so it'll kill you. So if he tells you that, you know, if you hear that, maybe go to a doctor first to make sure it's cool. I've never fasted for 40 days. But, but I just started fasting a day and I saw results from it. Here, here's what happens. Here's the way I see it. And I just think, you know, you can't deny that God, Jesus did tell every one of us to fast. You can't deny that. Go read it. In Matthew 6, when you pray, when you give, and when you fast, do it this way. But you could, fa- could you fast one meal a week? Here's how I see it. When I fast, I don't let anybody know it. Now my wife has to know it because I don't eat dinner that night. But I get up in the morning, and I spend time in the Word, and I spend time in prayer. Paul said... I buffet my body and make it my slave. What I think fasting is doing is it's telling your flesh that your flesh is not in charge. My spirit is in charge of my flesh. And that's what I think fasting does. And when I fast, I've had God speak to me more. The morning coming off of a fast, when I'm sitting there, I open his word, I read it. And God will tell me something totally different than what I'm reading. He'll just speak something to me. Why? Because... My spirit is so ready to hear him. I'm not, I'm not sitting there confused in my mind. And as a matter of fact, when, when you're listening to God, if, if you hear different, that's confusing. My wife always says in James, it says the wisdom from God is peaceful, kind, gentle, full of mercy and good fruit. If, if, if you're saying, God, what do you want me to do here? And you're getting two different answers. That's not God. The enemy is an author of confusion. And so you just keep praying. Don't, don't strive for it. Just keep praying. That's really, really good. And I think that actually directly connects even with that, the second habit around confessing the word. You are, you are able to speak the word of God so clearly. And I've seen this in so many different times, situations from the board meetings to our, own, our relationship at breakfast at first watch, which is my favorite time ever. Um, so how, how have you approached just memorizing scripture? Anything there? I, mean, it's, I know time and attention, but anything, just even pra- any practical handles for them as, they, as they, they want to confess the word of God. How do you get that inside of you? What, here, here's what I did. I mean, I just, I needed this to work for me. When I, just to walk away from the things I was doing, I was, I was literally a mess in my life, and this needed to work. For one thing, I needed to show my brothers that I was making the right decision, and I needed this to work for me. So I was just so hungry, and what I was doing, the first year, I read my Bible between an hour and two hours every day, and you say, how in the world did you do that? I quit partying. It was easy. I didn't go to pool halls and shoot pool and get in fight and drink beer. It was easy for me. It's just like, let's just quit doing that stuff. And it was easy to spend an hour to two hours in the Word. But I started writing scriptures down that meant something to me. 
And, and it, was, it was just stuff that was practical to me, you know, how to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I read that, and it's like, so how do I get faith? And I wrote all these faith scriptures down. And when I was in college, we didn't have computers. I typed this up, and I'm a slow typer. You know, I typed this up, and it's, it's about 12 pages typed. And I would go out in this park in the mornings at 6 a.m., and I would confess these out loud. And I still got this today in this worn-out leather binder that I still confess. And now I can, I, can, I can look at this. I'm not good at memorizing, but I can hold this in front of me, and I can look at the first word of the verse and quote the whole verse. And that's kind of what I do. I can't just tell you what, you know, Galatians 3.16, I don't know. But if I looked at that first word, I can quote, I can quote it because I've done it so many times. And so I just think when that word's in you, it's easy to answer the devil when he's tempting you or he's going he's to attack us. And let me tell you something. Some of you guys are going to go into leadership. He will come after you harder than anybody else. You know, if the devil can make somebody like Pastor Mark or, or myself, fail, a lot of people fail with us because they're looking to us. Don't think that you're going to be immune when you become a leader. That's who the devil wants. But let me tell you something. Here's what I firmly believe. When you defeat him time and time and time again... I think he's going to go pound on somebody else. That's what I believe. But if you give in to him, he's going to come back, and he's going to come back stronger. But he doesn't want to get bloodied every time he battles you. He'll go find somebody else. I love that. So, so much great wisdom. And I think it's a challenge for us in a digital age, just thinking you were talking about how it's on your phone. You know, that's changed the dynamic of our relationship with even with Scripture is how easily accessible it is. And I love the, the fact that there was a journal. You took time and attention to write Scripture um, and then confessing that over time, I mean, years now, decades later, confessing that, getting it in your heart. And so just pushing past the convenience of even the technology we have and really meditating and, and digging into God's word, um, producing that fruit. It's so powerful. I want to jump into, I know there's, I mentioned this earlier, it's such a huge topic and a big part of your book is around hearing from God. And pretty much all of us, I think everyone in the room, myself included, we're, we're all in a position in our life where we want to hear, we want to do what, we want to do what God wants us to do. We want to follow his will for our life. For the students that are here, many freshmen are in the room. Uh, we now have our first junior class, as you know, uh, well know we have our first junior class. We're, juniors, where are y'all at? First of all, I love y'all. So, so good. Junior class, they're all at different stages of this, but asking, you know, um, what is, God, what's your will for my life as far as it relates to ministry, next steps, placement? There's probably some people thinking about a future spouse in the room, you know, how to know and discern God's will for who they will marry one day, et cetera, et cetera. And so I would love you to talk and just lean in anywhere you want to take that, but from that chapter in the book and from that habit in your life, hearing from God. Well, it's, it's one of my favorite topics, and I did hear Pastor Chris say years ago that it's the number one thing that college students ask, and I would agree with that, dealing with a lot of, a lot of young people. Um, first of all, you've got to understand that God loves you, man. It, you know, the Bible says, I know how much I love my kids. I'd give my life for my kids. Ever since they were born, I would take a bullet for them. There's no thought about it, and I'm still that way. God, it says, since you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven give, know how to give what is good to those who love him? That tells me that God loves me so much more. Well, if God loves me that much, don't you think he wants us to know how to live? The answer is absolutely. He just, the Bible says he's looking to and fro throughout the earth to find a man whose heart's totally his so that he can support him. Well, if we're that person, God wants to support us. And so... Here, here's a book you should all read, and, and I, don't, I don't know if it's been recommended here, but A.W. Tozer wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. It was funny. I read this in college and didn't really talk about it with my kids. And my daughter goes to college and sends me this book. She says, Dad, you have to read this book. It changed my life. And I just started laughing because, like, I read this book, you know, 20 years ago, and it, it mattered to me too. But A.W. Tozer was a, just a, a common man who became a preacher and fell in love with Jesus many decades ago. And in this book, he said this. The Bible says that, that the Word of God is living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword, right? Well, he takes that and he says, if, if that's true, if the Bible is living, he said you should, I think it's on page 57. It's funny I know that, but I've said it so many times. He's, he says you should open the Bible like it will speak to you. It's the Word of God. Open it like it will speak to you. And just let, have you ever seen how you've read something 10 times and all of a sudden you read it? And it says something to you. It's like, that's like it was written for me today. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it's better if I go because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. It will be with you always. Think about that. He told the disciples that. Wait a minute, Jesus. We can't go to Jerusalem. 
they're going to kill you. He said, no, it's better that I leave because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who's going to be with you always. Guys, the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and at work in our mortal body. And what does the spirit of God do? He teaches us. He trains us. He reminds us of the things Jesus told us. And when we're reading the Bible, he will speak to us. And you just got to believe it and then do what I said earlier. If you can just, you've got to be willing to hear anything. When I asked my wife to marry me, this was a question that I had formed for many, many months. And it was very important to me how she responded. I said, baby, if God tells us to sell everything and be missionaries in Africa, what would you do? And she immediately said, we'll go. I needed to know that. Why did I say Africa? Because with my fair skin, I thought that was the hardest place I could go. You know, being that hot sun. I mean, I just, I'd never been to Africa. It's like, you know, that'd be hard on me. But she said we would go. And, and interestingly, God has told us to pack everything and move and walk away from a career three times. And we've just done it because she's always been there. But we've learned to hear from God. So sometimes the Holy Spirit just speaks to you a verse that's there. Like I feel God spoke to me about fasting. I, I think he spoke to me about confessing the word because it's right there in the Bible. But a lot of times he speaks to me just when I'm reading the Bible. Or the other day I was praying about my company and God told me. I was just praying for my employees. And God just brought a person to my mind that I needed to talk to that could help me with something in my business. And this, this was a God thing. And I just know that I'll probably laugh about this a couple years from now when I look back and say, that's funny how at 5 o'clock in the morning I was praying and God brought this guy's name to my mind. And here, here's another real quick thing, if I could, Mark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you it's got, hard you got the mic. talk when you're on the phone, but I mean, when you're on the stage. One time I was... Um, we were living in LaGrange, Georgia. I was an engineer. I ended up getting my degree from Auburn, believe it or not. Barely graduated. But I got my degree and got a job. And, and uh, for seven years, I was an engineer for a large manufacturing company. And they moved me between South Carolina and Georgia. I was back in Georgia. And God was just moving in my heart to move to Birmingham. And honestly, it was one place I never wanted to move because of all the people I knew I grew up with. I just didn't want to come back here. But God was working on my heart about it. And one day I went to the library, and I just, I just felt it was God. And I went to the library uh, at lunch. I'm an engineer, and I just go to lunch with my Bible. How weird is that? I didn't think it was weird. I just did it. I, 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 I could have gone out with the engineers and ate lunch. I went to the library and read my Bible, and I was just sitting there, and I was probably fasting. And I just said, God, I need to know, do you want me to go to Birmingham? And I'm just reading my Bible. There's nothing in the, in the, in the Bible about Birmingham, right? So I just read my Bible, and I would stop, and I'd just close my eyes and say, God, do you want me to move to Birmingham? Nothing. Kept reading. Five minutes later, God, do you want me? I'm just in my heart. I'm thinking he wants me to go, and I don't want to. But I've just, I've, I've learned to still my mind and say, it's not what I want, Lord. And I, I even pray that. It's like, God, not what I want. I want to do your will. Do you want me to go to Birmingham? And about five or six times, I heard nothing. And probably after 30 or 45 minutes of doing this, I heard God say yes. And I've done this enough to know that there wasn't a yes and a no. If there is, I just keep praying. That's not the Lord. But I just heard a very clear yes in my spirit. And I was like, God, you want me to quit my job and go to Birmingham? And I heard yes. And listen, I was like six weeks away from getting a very large, we got a Christmas bonus, but you had to be working there at the end of November. And I was going to, you know, and it was a lot of money. It was a big part of my salary. And I was like, God, you want me to quit my job right now and walk away from this bonus? And I heard yes. And I said, I need you to speak that to my wife. Because <laughs> this is scary. And I came home and, and, uh, and God had been working on her too. And she was totally, and I just went in like the next day and told my boss I was turning in my notice. He couldn't believe it. He's like, Glenn, you're, you're, you're on a fat, I had had three promotions in one year. Because I believe, and that's not on the, I think we're, we're to be the hardest workers out there, Christians. We need to be an example. When you go work in a church, you need to be the hardest worker there. So anyway, that's a, that's a side note, but it's, it's, not, it's not that, and, and guys, listen, I came to Birmingham and started climbing telephone poles with an engineering degree, because that's what I had done through high school and college, and two months later, I got moved out of state and did a job, and the owner of the company put me over his whole company. A year later, I was in 12 states, basically making more money in a couple weeks than I was making in a year as an engineer, and it was never about the money to me. I just wanted to be obedient to God. I just want to be obedient to God. Can we build off of that? First of all, that's, I, love, I love that part of your story, how you guys over and over have consistently heard God's voice and obeyed it, even when it did not make any sense you know, on paper. Can you lean in more so it's one thing to hear, another to obey? 
and how you have in those moments had that obedience. It, it sounds simple as you say it, but I know it comes from such a deep conviction about God. So I know a lot of students, I actually believe there's a lot of us, not just students, all of us who have heard from God, we have yet to obey yet. What are some of the secrets to that? Well, you know, it's funny because I, when, when I was young, 23 years old or so, I, I read that verse, 3 John 2, beloved John, remember, he was, he was a favorite disciple of Jesus, right? We all know that. It's like, yeah, it makes me sick. I like Peter. He was always ready to fight or whatever. But, but anyway, John was a favorite, and, and he wrote the book. In 3 John 2, he said, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you would prosper and be in health, which we all want, right, as your soul prospers. And I started studying this soul prosperity. I spent about a year studying it, and it just took me all over the Bible. I was just looking under prosperity and soul and and, and I landed on this. In, in Genesis, it, it talks about Abraham when God told him to take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him. There was no back and forth with Abraham and God. Abraham didn't say, God, you told me 15 years ago that he was going to be the one I got the blessing through. And now you're telling me to sacrifice him. It just said, so Abraham took him up on the mountain with the fire, with the wood. And, and then, you, you know the story. There was a ram in the, in the, in the bushes and but God didn't want him to sacrifice his son. He wanted to see if he'd be obedient. And so success in life comes from obedience. When Moses was dying, he wrote, you know, basically the first five books of the Bible. But Deuteronomy, he was writing this just before he knew he was dying. In Deuteronomy 28, y'all need to read Deuteronomy 28 through 30. The blessing and the curse, life and death. But the whole chapter, verse 28, is 14 verses of the blessing, 56 verses of the curse. It's all based on verse 1, if you obey my voice. And I was like, God, how can I obey your voice? You need to speak to me. I want to obey your voice. How do I? So hearing from God is so vital, but you gotta, you're not waiting for an audible voice. Just you, you have to have faith that when you're getting still and quiet before God, that your, your spirit is talking to you. You know right from wrong because God put that spirit inside of you. And when you, when you do that and just do it by faith, God has told me four times to walk away from a career, three times to pack up and move. And now as I'm older, I've been doing what I do now for 27 years, and I would have given it up 25 years ago. Every time I was doing as, as good as I'd ever done in the other business, and I started back over again. And it was always because God told me to. And what God showed me in the last several years, he said, Glenn, it was never about the business. It was about me making sure this was never about you. It was never about you. I gave you a talent, and if you thought it was about you, I would go find somebody else. You can still make a bunch of money and do this and that, but if you think it's about you, I will go find somebody else to use. And I just, I don't want to be that person. I want God to use me forever. I think when I'm 90, I'll still be doing stuff like this because I, I, I love God, and I don't want to be used up ever. I love that. Can you all put your hands together? I th I'm so grateful for your example. So grateful. Truly, truly for your example and just the treasure, the treasure chest you are of wisdom that, that has come from the, a, faith, a life of faithfulness. Um, you know, part of your obedience has been to, uh, to Highlands College, saying yes to God when he, he spoke to, you, to Lucy and you about Highlands College. I have a few more questions from the, from, from some of the students on the chapel team. Before that, though, I think it would be fun for our students to hear why you all said yes to Highlands College and why you believe in these students more than they can possibly realize. I mean, it's from the depth of who you guys are, you believe in Highlands College. Well, it's, it's interesting. and You know, we all need to be submitted to a pastor, a spiritual authority, right? And, and I've got a lot of pastors in my life, including this one, these guys over here. Um, they're spiritual authorities over me. And I think that, that real blessings come when we're submitted to authority. And um, Pastor Chris, in the early days of our legacy team, there were probably two or three dozen people in the room. Today in the legacy, you know, that's probably before it was even called the legacy team. But today there's hundreds of people that come in this room right here. Um, Pastor Chris, several years ago, maybe eight or nine years ago, he said this. He said, it was the first time I ever heard him say that if he had one thing to do, it would be the college. Now he says it all the time. But it was the first time I heard him say it. And he talked about why he wanted to invest in the future generation. And, and my wife and I, we were driving home that night, and we just talked about it. We said, you know, we love our pastor, and I'm submitted to him. And if this is his passion then it needs to be our passion. And we just made an agreement together that th this was going to be our passion too. And so at the time, we, we always have believed in tithing to your local church. 
But we were given significant amount of money to other ministries around the world that we believed in. And we just brought that focus back to Highlands College. And we started giving all that money to Highlands College. And I'm telling you, God, God has blessed that, I believe. Um, y'all have seen Lee Domain's book, maybe, but Kings and Priests about how we're to, you know, he talks about businessmen and pastors being united and in agreement. And that's how God's blessings really come. And my business has been blessed beyond what I can ever take credit for. And I believe a lot of it is because I'm in alignment with my church and my pastor and this college. And guys, I, you know, I love college students because y'all are making decisions that are big. And I like to be a part of that. I like to teach you how to hear from God and make it practical because it, it, it's just not as hard as the world wants to make it. Or, you know, the media would tell you that's not for today. God doesn't speak. It's like, well, my God does. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he does speak to me. So I want to teach y'all that, that it's not. But anyway, that this, this college is a passion to me and it always will be. I love to be around young people and just seeing y'all worship God. I mean, this fills my heart. And I love that. And I want to just say this. Um, I just felt even as you were sharing that, led for, for all of you guys, there was, you know, this was, this was that when you heard that from Pastor Chris would have been, I guess, probably 12 years ago, 13 yeah, years ago, well. early on in the HC journey. Some of you guys were very young at that age. None of y'all were sitting in these seats at that age, but God knew you would be here. So God was creating provision for the seat you're actually sitting in, in the obedience of not of Glenn and Lucy and so many others who've come around this vision. Y'all, we serve a big God. And I think we do. I, what I love about these habits is the, how deep and real they are, but honestly, the simplicity. I think a lot of times we overcomplicate our faith. When you come back to the center of it, God's up to something, and our job is to come into alignment with that. And I definitely have seen that in y'all's life. You talked about being underneath authority, how you're underneath God's authority. You're submitted um, to your pastor and how God has brought you guys so much influence through that. You've been able to leverage that for the kingdom of God. And, and I think that's uh, truly amazing uh, to be to be able to be be a, a part of that and, and to receive that from the college standpoint, but more than anything, as as a, as a man, you have made me better in every way. So I love you, I love you so much. Uh, we only have like seven minutes left, and so we're going to do a few questions. I want to jump into some of these. These came from our from our chapel team. Y'all give it up for the chapel team. So um, I wish we could get to all of them. There's there's nine questions here. I think we get maybe a couple, two or three. But um, I think this is a great one for everyone in the room. It's just I love this perspective from, from your own faith journey, but also you lead a company with lots of employees. You've been around lots of leaders in different areas of influence. You're so well-connected um, and just here in Birmingham, around, we're re- literally around the country with other leaders. What, what do you see as one characteristic that every leader should possess? As, have, you, have you been around leadership for so long? Well, for me, it would be integrity. Um, integrity is probably not the, the fastest way to become successful, but it might be the fastest way to take it away from you. And, and it's funny how I've seen a lot of uh, successful people that when money's on the line, um, their morals will change. And, you know, being honest just shouldn't be that hard. It's really not. But, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're not honest with a dollar bill, you won't be honest with a million dollars, you know. So integrity is just vital because it can destroy a ministry and it can destroy your career if, if you lie and, and you're not trustworthy. So um, I think integrity is vital. I love that. Here's, an, here's another great, first of all, you just dropped a serious, <laughs> serious revelation there. It's just the fastest way to lose it, which is so true. And we see that way too, honestly, way too often even in the ministry space. I know it's true in business, mm-hmm. um, but it's way, way too often in ministry. And that's, you know, one of, I know one of your passions is our character pillar, uh, which is in t- integrity is a big part of that, um, that space. And it's important for all of us. Um, here's, here's another, I think, a really great um, just perspective. I know there are students in the room. Every person in this room is called to ministry. I know that's going to be expressed in a way. Some of these students are just beginning to even imagine how that's going to be expressed. But there definitely are students in the room who have a ministry heart and calling that they know is going to combine in some level with the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Uh, that God's going to use them maybe in a business sphere. So we have a couple of questions just around business. And it says, what would, uh, one of these is, what would your top advice be for someone who desires to start a business but is unsure of where to begin? Uh, you know, I've started many businesses, and I think that the key is to find something you're passionate about. But... As far as what to start, I mean, go find somebody that's successful at it and duplicate what they do. I don't think the Bible says God's not a respecter of persons. That tells me that if I do what somebody that's successful has done, I will get the same results over time. I just got to figure out what they've done. So finding somebody that's in that field, but then find something you're passionate about. Life's too short to do something you don't enjoy. I saw my dad in the same career for, for his whole life. And at 59 years old, the company went bankrupt and it devastated him. 
you know, and I just, that's part of why I'm self-employed. I'm not going to let somebody else control me. Um, but, but anyway, find something you're passionate about, and God wants you to work with passion. I don't, I don't have a problem getting up in the morning. I love getting up. I'm passionate about life. And it's not Mondays I do not dread. I love Mondays. It's a new week, man. I'm just ready to go. And find something that, like that that you're passionate about, and then put everything into it. I love, I love that. Um, as a business leader, I'm just thinking from this perspective, what are some of the things you appreciate and respect most in ministry leaders? And what, what would you mm-hmm. love to see come up even out of this room? Well, so... Two things. I mean, the, the, the pastors in this church that I'm the closest to and have the most respect to, most respect for have humility, like this man right here, um, Pastor Chris. When, when you get up on stage and you start getting accolades, you need to remember that that's not you. That's a gift that God has given you. And pride is simply taking credit that God deserves. And... and I'm not saying you will totally be destroyed by that. The Bible does say pride comes before the fall. But why would you take credit that God gets? God gave you a talent. So stay away from pride. Have humility, understanding that God gave it to you. But then secondly, hard work. I think one of the things that's always frustrated me, early in my career I wanted to hire Christians, and I realized most Christians are lazy. I'm just telling you guys, in the business, that's what I see. I don't want you to tell me you go to church. Tell me how hard you can work. That's what I'm paying you for. Um, As Christians, look, if you've ever known some Mormons, Mormons are the hardest working people. And I I worked with some early, and it was embarrassing to me. They should not work harder than me because I'm a Christian. And I need that badge of Christianity to be strong. And so I just tell you, go out and find things to do. You don't have to wait for your boss to tell you. When you get a job, don't wait for your boss to tell you what to do. And be willing to do what this guy did out of college. where He worked for a church. He was cleaning the bathrooms. You know, Mark didn't want to do that, but he did it faithfully, and I bet he worked hard at it because he's always worked hard. I, I, I tell Jill all the time, I was a professional cleaner. <laughs> they Does paid, she have you doing it they, now? When I, when I clean the house, I'm like, they pay, I was paid to clean. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> you know. um, I, lo- I love that. And that humility and, and hard work um, are massive, and they're, 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 um, they're permission to play. I think when God wants to promote, they're permission to play. And so thank you for sharing that. Last question, I wish we could get to, get to all of these. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about family, life, business, and you're so successful in business, but you're even more successful in family. And I know that's something, I love the fact that this is always on the hearts of our students, is how to, how to have a successful ministry. All that's important for them. They wouldn't be here, but they desire to be healthy in their marriage one day and in their family. How, how have you and Lucy done that? Well, and it's a great one to end on, but, you know, growing up in a family with four kids and all four of us were, were on drugs, I was the only one that really broke away from it. I knew when I got married that if my kids got, I would quit everything I'm doing because what, are, what kids are screaming for is attention. If my dad would have just stopped and say, son, can we go play golf or go fish or go do something you're interested in, not what I'm interested in. He wanted me to play a trumpet. I didn't want to play a trumpet. I had no musical talent at all. Um, but if he would have just seen what I, and so I was real involved with my kids. But here's, here's the nugget. When you're in an environment, first of all, find out, Knowing God is my biggest value. That's something I, I, I strategically am, am focused on making sure I'm learning about God in a greater way every year. But my family is more important than my work. And I would put my work on hold for my family's sake. And my girls would tell you that. Somebody asked them in college, what was it like having a father that ran such a big business? And they said, we just knew him as dad. We didn't really look. And here's why. We had a, a, a lake house that we shared with my wife's brother and uh, down at Lake Martin, and we'd go down there from the time they were six years old, and when we were there, there were no phones, no computers, no TV. It was 100% daddy time with the girls. We'd go out in the boat, I'd pull them around, but I see now, I mean, you get in settings, and people are looking at their phone all the time. When you're with your, go in a restaurant, they're looking, they're on a date, and they're looking at their phone. For crying out loud, leave your phone in the car. When you're in in a moment, put your phone down and be totally in, totally, totally immersed in that conversation with the person you're with, and especially with your family. Make them feel important. I love that. Can you all thank Glenn for today? Love you so much.